Thank you, Kyung Hua, for giving me this opportunity to address the Asian society. It was many years since I, I, I came here. I was then the Minister for Information and the Arts, and uh, Mrs. Desai, at the time the President, had invited me to come see the small but very exquisite collection that the society has with the possible intention of uh, exhibiting some of that collection in Singapore. I've addressed the Asian Society in Hong Kong, but never here. It's a great privilege. I had a standing invitation from uh, John Taunton and Chang Hing Chi. Uh, that was before Kyung Hua became president. And I said, yes, not expecting to take it up uh, in the short term. But as it turned out, uh, my daughter married uh, an American Chinese. The wedding was last month, and in a few days' time, there'll be a wedding reception here in New York. And it's a long distance. I mean, traveling from Singapore to New York, I did not have to adjust my watch. <laughs> it's exactly the same time, <laughs> only 12 hours different. But I thought, well, since I'm here, I should maximize it. And I said, well, I have this invitation, so I should take the opportunity to launch my book. But my new son-in-law, before she married my daughter, had told my daughter that trying to launch three books is not a good idea. You should try to launch one condensed book. But condensing three books into one, it's not easy. I can't remember whether it was Tom Sawyer who said, it's harder to write a short letter than a long letter. But I thought since this was an opportunity, so I made the effort, it was more difficult than I thought. So now I have an international edition uh, for, for uh, North America and for Europe, which I'm launching this evening and uh, co commending it to you. And it, as it also turned out, uh, Yesterday was the 40th anniversary of my marriage to my wife. And we went back. <laughs> we went back to the church where we were married in Boston. And the chaplain in Harvard, who married us then, came back from retirement to say Mass for us. And this time, the presence of all our children. It was, it was very moving and to us a very in awe of the divine mercy because these are not things that you can plan for and when they happen we are filled with a great sense of, of gratitude. Many years ago I knew a Roman cardinal who was Secretary to John Paul II. And he was drafting a speech for the Holy Father. In that speech, he said, for the gathering of bishops, that despite our diversity, we are one. The Holy Father wagged his finger, struck out because, uh, despite, and wrote because. Because of our diversity, we are one. In other words, we are one only because we respect that each of us is unique, that each culture is unique, that each country is unique. If we want as a condition of a relationship that the other person should be like us, that's not a relationship. There's a dictatorship. And those who attempt procrastinate solutions end up committing great evil. And this problem we confront today, a plenty partly caused by technology, partly caused by globalization, certainly aggravated by the social media, where we are taught to stereotype the other, to demonize the other, to hate. To a point where we refuse even to communicate, to concede that perhaps the other side has a point of view which is legitimate. 
this we see in international re relations, this we see in our own societies. What we need is to respect differences, to respect that each of us has a separate evolution. You know, at home, the mother will never treat the children equally. When one is sick, all attention is on the one who is sick. The father is a bit more of a capital, capitalist, you know. He, <laughs> he calculates, it's more transactional. But the mother, no. The mother cares for everybody. In our society today, there is not enough of the feminine, in, feminine instinct to see each for what he is and to help that person, to interact with that person for what he or she is. Without being preachy, somehow this theme recurs in different parts of musings. And um, I, it's not my intention to be, a, to be a preacher, to be a missionary, because I was for many years in government and I was a prime minister, trade minister, I had to negotiate, uh, I had to deal with uh, uh, my counterparts from other countries, sometimes to resolve very difficult conflicts. And I was delighted that when my daughter got married in Singapore, uh, many former foreign ministers from the region, from countries with which Singapore had difficult issues, came. And we recognized as each, we recognized one another as old warriors, who despite the battles we fought, had in fact an affection for one another. So if we have this, that even though we're different, even though we may see in the other things that we dislike, we concede that that person may also see in us things he or she dislikes. But if we think of the positive aspects, there are so many things which should bind us together. And this, the world badly needs. And I think all of us you know, only to circles where we can should build bridges rather than blow up bridges. The Asia society was formed to build bridges across the Pacific. Multifarious links which are precious, many of which are now being sundered, decoupled, disengaged because of prejudices because of fears. And if those of us who are appalled by what is happening do not, in our own ways, big or small, do our bit to build bridges, it will be a more dangerous, uglier world. When we come back, when my wife and I come back to New York to meet old friends, to celebrate how my youngest son was saved in St. Jude and how my wife was saved in MD Anderson in Houston, we realize how important these links are, not only in a geopolitical sense, but at a human level. Many of us come from families which straddle the Pacific and we will be terribly hurt if the geopolitical conflicts that we see before us today get worse. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, George, for that rather philosophical uh, opening to our discussion on a very real um, geopolitically difficult issue of U.S.-China relations. Um, and you, you've directly engaged with issues. You, you have observed this issue. You have commented on this uh, issue for, for years, for decades. Um, so let us continue the conversation. I think um, recently, I think we are seeing both sides trying to manage the competition. And uh, the ambassador to China, Nick Burns, came here to say, there's no doubt about it, we are in a long-term strategic competition with China. And he also added, but the US has no intention of being number two in this competition, meaning they clearly want to win. 
Um, that is a, a statement of a, a very tense relationship. And so managing things is one thing, but how do you then go beyond that management into a, a relationship that is more constructive, more reassuring for the world, more, as you say, that builds rather than seeks one-sided interest at the, at the expense of the other. I think that's the kind of world that we want to see. How do we bring that about? I watched that video in preparation for our event this evening. And that remark about the US not being number two troubled me the most. Because it suggested that the US would do everything it could to prevent China from being number one. And the Chinese ambassador to Washington of many years, Chu Tiankai, after he retired, he went back to Beijing. I think it was the end of 2022. He, he gave a speech, scripted, where he said that there is no bottom line to the ill will which the US has for China. I was shocked by what he said, and I looked back at the video, and I saw him reading from a script. It was a prepared statement, and therefore in the Chinese system, approved in some way, a warning to the Chinese people to be prepared for the worst. If both sides continue along this path, I think there'll be great trouble. I think China is prepared to accept the US for what it is. It may have its wishes that the US is in secular decline, but if the US recovers, I think China is prepared to accept that it is a country with very special strength to which the children of many of the leaders there would want to come to, to study, to do research and to work. Mm -hmm. And perchance even to settle. They know that. Uh, what they do not want is for the US to want to somehow uh, change China in its own image. To me, that's completely unrealistic. Unreal I mean, there are China scholars who have invested almost their, their life studying China. They love China so much, they want to change China. And when they find that China has not changed, that love turns to hatred. That cannot be the basis of love. That I love you because I can change you. That's the basis for trouble. <laughs> yeah. And China has its own deep nature because of its own history. There's no country which has a more recorded history of its own past than the Chinese. So it's deep, extensive codification. How do you change them? Even Xi Jinping can't change it. Mao Zedong, before he died, he said, in the end, I've only changed a few things in my own neighborhood. He launched a cultural revolution, wanting to change China, and he failed. Because it is, as a civilization, the most conservative in Chinese history, and which is why it has survived so long. So for the US to think that it can change China, that's an illusion. And if one builds hopes on an illusion, it can only lead to one outcome, to tragedy. But if the US accepts China for what it is, I don't think China wants to be number one politically. You'll be number one economically because of the size of its population. But it doesn't want to take on the burdens of being global hegemon, of being global policemen, of ensuring that the waterways are open, that there is a working international system. You'd be quite happy if the US were to do that. So if what the US seeks is not to bring China down, or to prevent it from rising. But they say, look, in the multipolar world, in the end, we'll still be primus inter Paris. We'll be the first among equals because of the English language, because of standards, because the US itself is a meta system, a pluribus unum, with diverse components, but held together in a constitutional republic. 
sustained by certain values of freedom and democracy. I think even the Chinese people admire that. They're not sure it can work. It certainly cannot work in China. But when they come to the US, you are a researcher, you are a taxi driver, you are a software programmer. Yeah, it's, it's a working system and I'm fairly treated. Mm -hmm. uh, George, I think the idea of the US trying to change China, I think that's um, whether that is the real attention is also debatable. But I think uh, there are many things uh, that China does as a matter of fact and behavior that the US and many other countries uh, uh, receive as going against their interest. So for example, recently this issue of Chinese overcapacity and that leading to the US 100% uh, tariff on EVs and lesser ones on the, on the supply chain. So you know, you know, leave aside the issue of the you know, desire to change. But when faced with something that China does that is seen as damaging the national interest, these kinds of reaction then come from the United States. And of course, that then leads to greater distrust and, and mutual finger pointing. And I think you know, also the South China Sea is a very sensitive area where we hear daily news of uh, China's so-called gray zone maneuvers in these sensitive areas. So there are facts happening that makes it very difficult to have a generous uh, understanding. And also, I think China doesn't explain itself very well beyond such eloquent, uh, uh, eloquent uh, speakers like yourself. Well, in terms of overcapacity, I think the problem is Chinese <coughs> competitiveness in certain sectors of manufacturing. It has always been the case that when China is at peace and organized, it is the most productive economy on earth. Take, say, Chinese pottery. It, when, in every dynasty, when they are at peace, they all produce everybody. And naturally, others feel threatened. And indeed, the industries are, are threatened. So when British cotton and fabrics became competitive, so competitive, and India had to import them, it completely decimated the local Indian mm -hmm. textile and fabric industry. If India were independent and autonomous, it would have blocked the importation of British textiles, but they could not. So I see the reaction of America and Europe to Chinese competitiveness as natural. And perhaps it's not possible to avoid trade negotiations and manage trade. So if you allow the free importation of Chinese EVs, then eventually you'll lose the industry. But if you protect, you're imposing a cost on your own consumers. Will the time it buys you, enables you, and it enables you to to catch up on productivity. If you cannot, then you should shift position because there's a cost involved mm -hmm. in buying that time. Mm -hmm. When I was trade minister, I gave a speech once that the juggernaut is coming down the expressway. If you stand in front of it, that's not very wise. But if you move aside and catch the draft, you'll be pulled along. So you need more careful strategizing. If you're only responding to the pain felt by ordinary people and reacting first order, the result will be greater pain later. So in the case of Singapore, we are too small to be price makers in the world. We are price takers. So we adjust. In this area, I cannot compete. So instead of competing with you, you become a factor input, a cheap factor input to what I want to export. Then I gain from your competitiveness. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there has to be this more subtle, deeper, longer term thinking. Mm -hmm. But very difficult in a democracy that survives 
from one election to another. Because all the time you're facing pressure from the ground, and your responses are short term rather than long term. Chinese competitiveness in the end relies upon a very large internal market and a very hardworking population. I mean, they work on weekends. I mean, in, it's infecting Singapore now. There's a term, TGIT. Instead of Tango is Friday, it's becoming Tango is Thursday. Well, why not TGIW? <laughs> I mean, well, you can do what you want with yourself. But in the end, you've got to compete in the global marketplace. Well, keep out the world. OK? Then where will you be in 20 years' time, 50 years' time? You'll be nowhere. That's what happened to the Qing Dynasty, right? They, they kept out. They told Lord McCartney, 1793, the Qianlong Emperor. There's nothing you have that we are interested in. There's nothing we can learn from you. Go home. And the result was a precipitous decline. And this is now a challenging period in Western society because the system prevents longer term strategizing. It's not that people are not aware of the problems, are not capable of the analysis, analysis, but they are constantly having to respond to short term electoral pressures. Hmm. Well, I think from the uh, climate change activist point of view, they want all of those EV not tariffed, but bought and distributed through the world so that uh, as a, the world as a whole will have something to show for our fight against um, climate change. But I think you make the point that as governments, there is certainly a need for strategizing and subtle policy implementation to protect, in the end, your industries as well. I can talk about the South China Sea if you wish, but... Uh, I know, I've read your book. Yes. I know you have a very different view of the whole situation, and, and uh, I've learned a great deal. Uh, I think uh, that uh, China never signed up for arbitrary... Uh, compulsive arbitration. Compulsive, uh, and, and had to, and therefore could not accept the, the decision that came out, and the history surrounding the nine dots, I, you know, it's in there, but I want to move on to Taiwan, mm. because that is mm. the, you know, the most important, to put it mildly, uh, issue between the United States and China. China you know, Taiwan had a inauguration of a new president. Um, his inaugural statement didn't indicate any policy changes, but the re rhetoric certainly uh, could cause discomfort in Beijing, and Beijing responded with a very heavy military exercise. Um, but I think the sense is that the leadership in Beijing is, is waiting things out to see what happens in the next US presidential elections. I think many are on many fronts. How, 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 so I think the, the risks are being managed, if I could put it that way, in this period. Well, how do you read the situation? How would you like to see the, the situation evolving before the and after? In the short term, I, I don't see uh, war uh, because the US doesn't want war over Taiwan. Uh, whether there's war over Taiwan, really depends on the US. China has made its position very clear. Kissinger spoke about it repeatedly, that when he dealt with Zhou Enlai and Mao Zedong, they kept on coming back to Taiwan. So the moment the US departs, de facto or de jure, from a one China position, there's a red line for China. Mm -hmm. And the US knows that when it moves towards that red line, the Chinese bark louder. When they retreat, the Chinese squat and down. So the US knows that there is a red line. And when Lai Xing Te won the presidential elections, the US sent two retired officials, Steve Hadley and uh, Jim Steinberg, to Taipei. And they met Lai Xing Te, they met Zhu Li Lun of KMT and Ke Wen Tse with a simple message no Taiwan independence. And they flew home. So that was very clear. Without US underwriting Taiwan independence, it's futile. Lai Xing Te is darker green than Tsai Ing wen. So he's got to, he cannot betray his own ground. Mm -hmm. So he's got to say certain things. The Chinese response is, is, is very predictable. Every time 
you move beyond an earlier position, we tighten the cordon, we tighten the noose. It is a ratchet. The next tightening will be from that position. So when Pelosi visited Taiwan, they exercised closer to Taiwan. This time around, after Lai ching speech, they moved even closer. The Taiwanese know this. So you play this game, the news tightens further. Can you win? You cannot win. Would the Taiwanese fight the Ukrainians? They will not. They will say it to themselves and they will say it to foreigners they are comfortable with. Of course, the US would love to fight China down to the last Taiwanese, and the Taiwanese would like to fight China down to the last American, <laughs> but neither would do so for the other. So, in the end, you've got to find a way to look after ordinary Taiwanese, because if you don't, the DPP will be wiped out in the next election. And this time around, they don't control the Legislative Assembly. They need to work with the other two political parties. Now, China takes comfort in the fact that 60% of Taiwanese voted against the DPP and therefore voted against independence, so they like to think. But among young Taiwanese, the percentage is much lower. And they know that. Which means that if China doesn't work to engage even the DPP, the lighter green parts of the DPP, I think the problems in the future will be trickier. And using force to solve this problem is suboptimal. They cannot give up force, because if they, if they give up force, then there will never be unification. And the Americans and other countries would want to, to be a division between China and Taiwan forever, if they could contrive it. That's what they wish. China won't allow that, so we say, okay, there should be a gradual convergence, and they'll try to delay it for as long as possible. So this is a, a game being played. The tail end of a long Chinese civil war, which has been peaceful. Hopefully it will be peaceful. But if it is kept open, then one day it will lead to grief. Mm. But I don't see Lai Qingde having a lot of room to play. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, the cool heads prevail. Uh, um, so I think you know, getting into the election leaves all of us in the, in the conundrum, so I will not get into that discussion. But speaking of ASEAN, there, you know, there, we, did, we see a difference in the ASEAN election, uh, reaction to the situation in Taiwan. So uh, as I remember, um, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, I think, you know, uh, after the election in Taiwan, reiterated their support for the one China policy without, without any mention of uh, the, the election. And then Singapore and Philippines, I think, uh, congratulated the, the victory in the election. So there's differences. And I think we all want peace and stability, but how you then verbalize that into a response to what goes in, in Taiwan is, is a bit different and diverse, even among ASEAN. So let's talk about ASEAN. I don't think uh, any ASEAN country wants to get involved in the Taiwan conflict, not even the Philippines. Uh, there's no profit there. Uh, in the case of Singapore, we have a special relationship because our soldiers trained there from the time of Jiang uh, Jingguo. Lee Kuan Yew made it clear to Jiang Jingguo that one day when Singapore recognized China, the ROC flag, ROC state crest, we have to come down. So when we recognized China, and all these things happened, there was no surprise. And China knew that we have a special relationship with Taiwan, which if we play carefully, is advantageous to China. Mm -hmm. So the Wang Ku talks took place in Singapore in 1993, and Xi Jinping, in a remarkable gesture, met Ma ying as an equal in Singapore in 2015. So Singapore's position is unique. It, it, it is not 
a position which any other country can easily take. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the Philippines, um, because of the current conflict over the second Thomas show, or Renai Xiao, uh, there's a little cat and mouse game being played. Um, it can lead to accidents. Someone lost a finger yesterday, I think. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's really childish. I mean, what, 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 what's happening? The Americans are egging the Filipinos on, but at the same time telling them, don't start a war. Mm -hmm. I think eventually good sense will prevail and some way by which each accommodates the other uh, will be found. We don't need extra, an additional conflict mm -hmm. in our region. Yeah. And no one, really no one wants it. Yes. Yeah. Well, I can certainly say that about uh, another potential flashpoint in, in, uh, in my part of the world. And you've been a keen observer of that part, the Korean Peninsula and the North Korean issue. So I think we do have time to probe that issue a little bit. But I think that Putin, Mr. Put, President Putin is, uh, is visiting North Korea as we speak on his uh, first visit back to North Korea in 24 years. Um, he visited in 2000. This clearly demonstrates the relationship between North Korea and Russia becoming much more closer than it used to be prior to the war in Ukraine. I think the war in Ukraine has been an, 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 an opportunity for North Korea out from its diplomatic isolation. Um, big concern there from the United States and South Korea certainly uh, and I think China also would be watching this with a great deal of wariness. You know, there's this tendency to lump China, Russia, and North Korea together. Then US, Japan, and, um, and Japan together as, a, as the two, two sides on this new Cold War in Northeast Asia. I think China's position on looking at what's going on between Russia and, and North Korea is much more uh, complicated and nuanced than that. How do you think China would be looking at this, you know, rapprochement between North Korea and Russia? China has cleverly inserted itself, in, entranglated for itself, a, a very comfortable position where all sides need its support and cooperation. In 2009, when I visited North Korea as a foreign minister, I brought my wife along. Uh, it was very sad. Many windows were broken, covered with plastic sheets. And they get very cold winters up there, you know. And I heard later that the Chinese donated a glass factory. After I left government, 10 years later, 2019, I visited North Korea again. Despite sanctions, Pyongyang looked much better. And again, I went down south to the DMZ, and the countryside was much improved. So despite sanctions, North Korea has been able to sustain itself, build up its nuclear capabilities, ICBM capability, and largely help body and soul together with a great sense of dignity. South Korea has 30,000 American GIs. North Korea will not countenance even one single soldier from the PLA. Only dead once in the cemetery. So these are very determined people. And now with the Ukraine war, Russia has decided not to be part of, not to uh, allow the continuation of a UN agency to police sanctions. North Korea today, has escaped. They will now work with Russia, and that's why Putin is in North Korea. So North Korea, Iran today will benefit from what has happened in Ukraine. And they, are, they can no longer be confined. And even when they were confined, they still managed to make remarkable progress. So a way must be found to, to talk, to reduce tension, to gradually take small steps towards peace. It's very tragic, the Korean people. Now, I like the Germans, who were the aggressor during the Second World War. 
and therefore divided. North Korea was a victim before the end of the Second World War and remained divided till today. And China's position is they have a right to be reunited. So Teng Xiaoping took this position, summarized in the usual Chinese way. If the South invades the North, China will support the North. If the North invades the South, China will not be involved. But not to oppose it, because unification of the Korea is a right of the Korean people. That's their belief. And their ambassador in Pyongyang is always senior to the ambassador in Seoul. In fact, their ambassador in Pyongyang always comes from the International Liaison Department of the Chinese Communist Party. But at the same time, they're very intimate links with South Korea, with which they have a very strong economic relationship. And when South Korea allowed the American to deploy air defense radars for the TED system, they punished North South Korea. And in the end, South Korea had to adjust its position. So they keep their links to North and South Korea, to Russia, managing their relations with America and with Japan. So China is, in fact, playing a very skillful game, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I could go on and on, but I think we're already over our due time. But I have to go to your book, give you some minutes to talk about your book. And I have a signed copy here. <laughs> I have to say it's been one of the most enjoyable readings uh, that I've come across recently, really full of uh, gems of knowledge and, and, and insight. Um, but just to end our conversation on your book, uh, there's so much in this, but of all the things that this book you know, shows that you've been involved in and, and, and engaged in, if you, so of all the musings that you've did, um, what would you count as your most proud moment And on the one hand? And on the other hand, what would you say remains a point of regret or a point that clearly sees failure? I, I'm philosophically a Taoist. Uh, I'm, I'm a Roman Catholic, but philosophically very inclined to the Taoist view that we are part of larger flows. If we succeed, it's because the flow is aligned with what we do. So we succeed. If we fail, it is because we are misaligned. So I tend not to be too, too elated when I succeed, nor too despondent when I fail. The key for me is uh, understanding the larger flow and moving with it. In the case of Myanmar, on which I spent a great deal of time, when I first met Aung San Suu Kyi after I had left government, I told her, Dosu, I'm so happy to meet you. I spent so much time talking about you, and I'm meeting you for the first time. And it's a privilege. And to see what has since happened is heartbreaking. I don't blame myself or Singapore because the country is trapped in a very difficult situation. But we should all at least try to be peacemakers and not, and not be troublemakers. So it fills me with pain, but at the same time, I understand that it will take time. No, and it's not entirely a bad thing that in, in Myanmar today, no party, not the government, not the NUG, not the, the, the ethnic military organization, no one, can win completely. If the center breaks, the country will dissolve into civil war for years to come. I don't think it will. There will be a kind of a no war, no peace, live and let live situation. And the fever will not go away, but if we bring the fever, manage, keep the fever manageable, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. And let time heal the body politic gradually. So Myanmar, fills me with a certain sorrow. Our relationship with Malaysia has improved a lot. One issue which bedeviled us was something quite obscure, which was uh, a railway line from Malaysia running to Singapore, owned by Malaysia, which prevented us from level crossings in many parts. There was an agreement between Mahathir and Lee Kuan Yew 
which was never implemented. And it, the ground was so poisoned, it was difficult to find a solution. But when there was a change of prime ministership in Malaysia, and I had to deal with a new foreign minister, I decided to make an effort. In the end, I had a breakthrough. I can't take credit for it, <laughs> because the ground had shifted, and I was able now to move when in the past I could not. But still, it's nice. And if you give me some credit for it, I'll happily accept. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. I think I was going to ask you about Myanmar, and it, it, Myanmar is a, is a painful point for, for me as well, having worked on that file in my UN days, on, both on the humanitarian and the human rights front. The ground is shifting there as well uh, over the past couple of months. The dynamics on the ground have shifted mostly in favor of the, the militias. Um, but yes, uh, it's not going to switch overnight. It's not going to be back to peace and democracy overnight. So, but we shall we shall pray and and uh, hope uh, the best um, under very difficult circumstances. Yeah.